And welcome to the April 18th Worship Experience with United Christian Church. I'm James King, Senior Pastor here at United, and I am, as always, so glad that you've chosen to be with us this morning 
to begin your worship here on Sunday morning. And so look, I'm just so glad you're with us. Now look, this morning we are going to be finishing up a sermon series entitled In Pursuit of Joy. Yeah, In Pursuit of Joy. And we've been studying through the book of Philippians. And so today, I'm not going to, I'm just skipping the preliminaries, diving right in. We're going to begin our, 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 our study, our discussion, our sermon this morning in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Oh, you know what? I am going to do a preliminary before we dive in. I just want to thank you all for being so faithful, first of all, in your giving. That is so important. And so I want to encourage you, watch to the end so that you'll know how that you can give to support our ministry. Secondly, I want to invite you to share this broadcast if you're watching on Facebook and you can just click that little share button. What that does, it allows other people to discover us and find us and share the experience that you're having with other people here at United Christian Church as we're watching online. And then lastly, I want to encourage those of you, if you're watching online and if you're watching on our homepage, which is um, www.uccdoc.com and you slide down to where it says watch live stream, when you click there, there's like a little chat window there where you can chat with people and there's also the Bible already there open to our study verse today which is going to be in Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 is what we're going to study and I'm going to be reading today from the new the new international version the NIV version so let's go to our focal scripture this morning now I've got the preliminaries out the way our scripture today therefore if you if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others." In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's good stuff right there. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together and to enjoy this technology that allows us to be all over the world and even in the same place at the same time. So Father, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would open the soil of our hearts that we might receive this word today, that it might change our hearts, change our mind and change our lives, that we might reflect your goodness and the grace of Jesus. So, Father, I take this moment now and I step out of this clay vessel and I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would preach through me, Father, because I know that if you don't preach, there will be no teaching. So, Father, have your way in me. We yield this time that you might speak to your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. As we complete this series about having a little more joy in our lives, I, I want us to hold on to the secret sauce that I told you last week, that this is the glue that holds all of these two sermons together. It is that joy is the emotional result of right spiritual choices. That if you want to have joy in your lives, that it's not going to be because you do the right earthly things. It's going to be because you make the right spiritual choices. So remember that this is the secret sauce. Now, last week when we looked at this letter um, that Paul had written to the Philippian church, we saw that it is a very joy-filled book. And I'm hoping that more than a few of us, we all agreed and said, you know, we're going to stick with these next two sermons because we just want to see how it's going to end. Because if we live in relatively comfortable accommodations and, you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay and living a joy-filled life for many of us, it's a struggle, if not downright hard. And while the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter while living in a prison, probably sleeping on a floor, he can have joy. 
that we're going to hang in here and see what the end's going to be. So I'm glad that so many of you made that decision. So look, we understood that our first choice that we have to make in order to have joy in our life was that we must focus on the right things. Yeah, you've got to focus on the right things. And this week, we're going to focus on the second choice that you've got to make in order to have joy in your life. So here we go. Point number one, in order for you to have more joy in your life, you must think like Jesus. Here's what we're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And it says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus, he had a very different thought process than anyone else. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, for sure. He thought differently than the religious leaders of his day. And he believed in giving people second chances when the law that they followed gave none. In fact, one of my favorite stories and my favorite stories that Jesus lived out is in John chapter 8, where there's a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, it's a whole nother sermon for us to talk about because if she got caught in adultery in the act, where's the man? But anyhow, she had been brought to Jesus in the presence of other religious leaders. The decision among all the leaders was, is that we've got to follow the law. And some of you are saying, well, what's the law? Well, the law is in, um, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, where it says that both parties are to be stoned. I said we would have a whole other sermon about what happened to the man. But since they only had the woman, she would have to do. After all, stoning the adulterer was the law of Moses. And that's what they had to do because that's what they obeyed. But Jesus, Jesus seeing everything differently, he invites the group to go ahead and stone her. I, I know you're all saying, what? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in the Bible. Read that. Jesus says that you guys can stone her. But here, the first person to throw the stone has got to be the one without sin. Yeah, you can throw her, but the first one to throw the stone is going to be the one without any sin. And slowly, the accusers dropped their stones, turned, and walked away. Nobody was stoned to death that day. Then Jesus turned to the woman and he asked her, he says, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more more. He gave her another chance to do the right thing because that's who Jesus is. He thinks differently about us. He thinks differently about our sins, our failures, our faults. He thinks differently about everything. And I am so glad that Jesus does. Aren't you glad about it? Jesus even thought differently about the customs and traditions that everyone of that day followed. Like, for example, in those days, if you visited someone's home, it was the, the, the job of the, the person who was the servant in the house to wash everyone's feet, of the, all the guests' feet. You got to wash their feet because, you know, they're walking. It's dusty. They're wearing sandals. Now, this was not the job of the host. No, it was the job of the servant to perform this courtesy. And it was the job of the host to make sure that this was all prepared and made ready. So when we think about the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples in the upper room, there was no servant to wash everyone's feet. So what happened? Jesus, who is the master, Jesus, the leader, Jesus, the host, Jesus gets up, grabs a bowl of water and a towel, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Changing the way we look at what leadership ought to look like. That the greatest leader among us also has to be the greatest servant. Jesus was thinking differently. So look. Look, here it is. If we want joy, we have to think like Jesus. And if we think like Jesus, I want you to know it may seem a little prop, a little complicated just reading these two examples. That if you're going to be a leader, you got to serve. And if you're going to see people and saying you got to give second chances, how else did Jesus think? Well, look, we're going to unpackage how we can think like Jesus a little bit more as we kind of dive deeper into Philippians 2. And we take a closer look so that we can gain a little more understanding. Which leads me now to point number two. Jesus didn't insist 
on his rights. Let's go back to the focal text this morning in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses seven, 5 through 7 from the NIV. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. Look, to think like Jesus, it means that you have to be challenged to live others first in a me first world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think probably you all might remember this, but almost every news source that covered the sinking of the Russian cruise liner, hope I get this name right, the SS Admiral Nakimov, Makinov, Makinov, yeah, Nakinov with an N. It was back in 1986, and while it would have been on its final cruise, the, the SS Admiral Nakinov was, Nakimov was traveling around the Black Sea, and it was struck by a Russian freight liner. It's one of those ships that has all the, like the, um, uh, the shipping crates all stacked on it. It was one of those that ran into it, bang, hit it like this. Happened late, late in the evening. You would think that the cause of an accident like this, where so many people lost their lives, would have been due to a technology failure or something, or that there might have been a huge fog bank that you know they just couldn't see, or maybe there was a radar malfunction. You see, both captains, they were completely aware of the presence of each other's ship long before there was a collision, but neither took action to make a corrective or evasive move until the last minute, and then even then, it was too late. Now, there are maritime rules that they provide guidance to, to ship captains in situations just like this. Guidelines that tell us, you know, who has the right of way and when you're coming in what direction, who should do what. Like, if, the, if there's an event where ships are going to, you know, going to meet head on, there are rules and guidelines that say, you know, who's supposed to go starboard or port. Don't ask me which that means. I think one means left, one means right. But there's rules that let you know who's supposed to do what. But even after the investigation... The investigators, they tried the best they could to figure out why this happened. And some investigators came to the conclusion that the only reason this accident happened was because of simple human stubbornness. That the two captains were just too proud to yield the way to the other ship, not considering the lives that were entrusted to them. Neither captain thought or cared enough about the people on their boats or the people on the other boats to simply make a slight course adjustment. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe that, that illustration kind of went over your head and you're not getting it. Let me tell you something even, even easier. I live, coming to my house, coming to my house, there's like a little road. And the road, it's pretty much just wide enough where, where two cars can comfortably get through if each person drives in their lane. But it never fails that when you're driving on the road, you're going to drive down there and there's somebody that's going to take up more of the lane than their own. In fact, they're just going to be driving there, which is going to force you to drive over there on the crumbly side of the street. You know what I'm talking about? And they do this frequently and you're just like, Ugh. and it makes you almost that thing inside you wants to raise up. And you want to like, well, if you're going to ride in the middle of the road, then I'm going to ride in the middle of the road. We're just going to play chicken. That's what we used to call it back in the day. We're going to play chicken and see who's going to move first. When we don't exercise our rights, because after all, this is the street I live on. This is my street. You're just driving through. That we could simply say, if you've got to get there that badly, get there. And we move over. Yeah, yeah. That's what that means. That's what that means. It means that when you see somebody parking in two, two parking spaces, when they could have parked in one and now you got to park a little further over because this person decided they're going to park like that. Or somebody's going to park in the handicap pace because they're only going to be in the store just for a few more minutes. And you who really need to park there that you can't because this person's in your spot. Yeah, all of those things. It means that we somehow allow that to go. And so my first action item for you, your first thing that you've got to do, and this is internal. You don't have to do anything external. You don't have to do anything for anybody else. Oh, in fact, in fact I forgot. We're going to check in. 
For those of you in our last action item, the, 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 the challenge was, what did you do to make someone feel that you love them? What did you do? Now, I want you just to write that right now in Facebook. So start typing that. What are some of the things that you did if you took this assignment seriously? And so you can do that on Facebook. You can do that also on YouTube if you're watching on the computer. Or you can do it on our church website. You can just click on the, t the chat and do that. This is something that me and Jackie did. So this past week, um, we know of a couple in our church that has really gone through a hard time. And so one of my favorite things to send and receive are those crazy stinking edible arrangement things. If you've ever gotten one, I don't know how they do it, but their fruit always just tastes the best. And then when they dip it in some chocolate, mmm. And so I sent one of those to them. And then I also thought about someone that I understand what they're going through. Um, these, th th this person lost their mother not long ago, about, about the same time my mother died actually, and which is just not long ago. And so usually when you're right in the middle of the loss, I'm giving you all time to chat and talk to each other, but right in the middle of the loss, people are all swarming. You got a bunch of cards and a bunch of flowers and a bunch of letters and stuff. But what happens maybe two, three, four weeks that go by? Because sometimes you and your thoughts are left. And so it's been about that much time. And I thought I would send them something to let them know that we love their mother too. And we miss them too. And so that's what I did. I just, I just sent them, di didn't hurt, um, just took some time. But that's those are the actions that I did. And I hope that you took that. They took some steps just to help somebody. And it didn't have to cost you anything. It just happens that's what I did. Now, here's the challenge for this week. And this week, instead of being more external, this is internal. Here's your action step. You need to examine your own life and ask yourself this question. Do you put your rights first and you don't care about what happens to others? Are you the person that rides us a little bit more into the other lane than you ought to? Because maybe you just need to have more, you think you need to have more space. Are you the person that parks in two parking spaces? Are you the person that just kind of does what you want to do? You make your own rules. Me and Jackie have a note about stuff when we see people who do that. We call it naming your own price. They just do what they want to do. Are you that person? Ask yourself honestly, do you put your rights and yourself first? Because you used to be the CEO or the president or whatever. Or you're this or you're that. And so you deserve this other thing. That's your challenge for today. Internally, ask yourself, do you put your rights before others? Because beloved, I would tell you that if you continue to pursue your rights, you're never happy. But let me keep going. Let me keep going. My third point is this. My third point, that if you want to think like Jesus, then we must understand that Jesus made a commitment to serve others. His whole life. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, here's what the text says. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I love that part. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Beloved, if Jesus wanted to hold on to his, his rights and position around Christmas time, it would be a very different scene, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I would imagine there would be no little sweet little baby Jesus, no little nine pound, three ounce baby Jesus lying in a little manger, all tiny and helpless. No, I don't think it would be like that at all. If Jesus were to hang on to his rights, then I believe the skies would crack open and there would be a flaming chariot just driving down to the earth and it was pulled by a hundred angels all carrying flaming swords. And then when Jesus parks the chariot and he steps out and he puts one foot on the earth, the entire creation begins to rumble and shake because of the knowledge that the Prince of Heaven has now come to earth. And then because Jesus is here, he comes to judge. And... You can almost imagine the rest of that sad story. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Jesus didn't come as the Prince of Heaven. Jesus came as an infant and grew to a toddler and then grew to a boy and a young man and finally a man. He knew what it was like to be hungry or thirsty. He knew what it was like to be hot and tired. Jesus knew what it was like to be tempted and to feel sorrow. 
Jesus indeed was the word made flesh that moved into our neighborhood. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15 says it this way, and I want to jump back and read it from the message for you because I just love the poetry of it. It says this, Now that we know that we have Jesus, this great high priest, with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experiencing it all, all but the sin. Beloved, we can be assured that we have a high priest in Jesus who knows and understands exactly everything, every pain, every joy, and every tear, because he has been there and done that. Look, I've got an image. I'm going to show this to you. So check this out. This is an image of the famous Roman aqueduct in Segovia, Spain. Segovia, Segovia, Spain. Get the words right. Segovia, Spain. It was built in 109 AD. That's a long time ago. In fact, AD means before Jesus. Just so you can try to figure out what that means. Yeah. So for 1,800 years, it carried cool water from the mountains into the hot and thirsty cities around the, around the town of Segovia, Spain. If, if you could count it up, that means that probably about 60 generations, men, women, children, animals, they drank from the flow of this aqueduct. And, and someone decided that because of this genius of engineering, because of its utter beauty, and it is beautiful, that it ought to be preserved as a, as a tourist monument and a tourist attraction and a museum and artifact so that the next generation could behold this amazing marvel. And this could be something that could last for centuries. And that's exactly what they did. They said what we'll do is that we're going to just take it and we'll put some modern pipes and we'll redirect the water and we'll give this ancient brick and mortar a well-deserved rest. And you know, as the aqueduct stopped serving this perfect purpose, stopped having this flow of water going through it all the time, it began to fall apart. With the sun beating on it, the mortar began to crumble and the bricks and the stone began to sag and it all threatened to fall. And so the town of Segovia, they have to now work on trying to prop it up to keep their little monument in place. Beloved, if you want to experience a life that is joy filled, that is vital and vibrant, you've got to think like Jesus and serve. Ah, that there has got to be some kind of flow going through you from the Father to you to the world. That you have got to adjust your life to be one like Jesus that is committed to a life of service. Let me keep going. I could go way deep on that. Let me keep going. Point number four in my last point. Jesus thought differently about valuing our lives over his. If you want to think like Jesus, then you've got to value your life over others. Let's go back now to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, reading from the NIV. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, I know what you're thinking. A life of service, obedience? You've got to be kidding. I mean, how can there be joy for my whole life, serving others at my own expense? Because you're saying that this cross is what it costs Jesus to serve us? Are you saying that now it's got to serve me? Let, let me just tell you a story. I know you're going to say it's not true, but it is. Uh, the church I had the, 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 the good pleasure of planting and, and serving for a number of years, we had a rule about what it meant to be a leader. In order to be a member of the church and a leader, you had to go on at least one mission trip every two years, either an abroad mission trip or a domestic trip mission trip. But you had to go on a mission trip at least once every two years. So the very first trip that we took as a group was at an orphanage near Oaxaca, Mexico. And what people had to do in order to go on this trip is that you needed to take 
and schedule vacation time from your jobs because many folks are working. You would have to purchase some goods that would be left behind because there are some things that they need there that they can't get in the U.S. And so we're going to pack up and load it up in a bunch of suitcases and bins and we're going to take it and leave it. So you're going to be buying some stuff for somebody else. And then you're going to save up money to go because you're going to have to put this trip on layaway because you're going to have to pay your own way. A plane ticket and a bus ticket to get there and then buy some food too. And when you got there, huh, when you got there, the first full day, well, you worked all day. You got a work assignment and you worked all day with only breaks for meals. That was it. And at the end of each day, you would be hot, you'd be tired, and you'd be dirty. But you couldn't go jump into a nice shower because there were limited water resources. Yeah, so there could be only a group that could take a shower at night. And then the next group could only take a shower in the morning and your shower only had to be about three minutes long because water was a valuable resource so you couldn't act like you was at home. Yeah, you paid money to do this. And this was the routine every day for about four or five days until we all got back home. There were about 50 plus people who went on that trip. And you would imagine that there would be many of them that they would make a vow. They will never do anything like that again. But you're wrong. Those people captured an understanding of what it meant to humble yourself and serve. That you were the president or the CEO or something. That you were this or that or that you won this award or that award. That you were this person or people recognized you or seen you this way in your church. You were nobody but Joe, Tom, Sally, Mary, and Dick on the trip. They learned that when you humbled yourself and you served, that you brought love and light to others. Love and light passed through you and flowed to others. And this is the essence of thinking like Jesus. Beloved, that trip was more than 10 years ago. And I got to tell you something. Would you believe this? Those people continue to this day to plan their summers and their budgets and their vacations so they can spend time working for free on a mission trip because they've got it. They understand what it means to humble yourself and you allow it to cost you so that you can serve. You look, blood, whether you know it or not, there is a thing about the way God made us you see, God made you and God knows you better than anybody. He knows what it takes to make you happy and what it takes for you to be a vessel for joy. And Jesus himself, he put our needs first so that he could model what it means to bring joy to others. You may think, was Jesus joyful about dying on a cross? Well, here's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says. I'm going to read it to you from the NIV and the message so you can get both the, 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 the traditional verse you heard before. And I want you to hear the language that the message places it. Because it gives us per perspective about what Jesus went through for from a life in flesh to facing the cross. Here it is. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated on the place of honor beside God's throne. And he gave Jesus the highest name, that at his very name, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me read it again to you. I just added it on there, but let me read it to you now from the message. Because the message says it like this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 in the message. Keep our eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. Jesus knew 
that by serving others and even by dying on the cross, the greatest act of service and sacrifice that anyone can make, that there would be a greater joy. And I need to tell you, I've got joy on this past Easter. I've got joy because of Jesus' sacrifice. And beloved, God has made us the same way. If you're trying to be happy, if you're trying to be joy by trying to get more money, trying to get more power, trying to get more fame, or trying to get more other stuff that you may want, I want you to know it's never going to work because you were not created that way. God created us that we might be vessels of joy. That by us serving and sacrificing, and even, it, even if it costs us something, that we are the tools of joy. And by giving joy, we somehow, in the most amazing way, receive joy. So look, I'm not saying you need to die on a cross for something, but what I am saying is this. Beloved, if you want to find more joy in your life, focus on what's most important. And two, Think like Jesus. Because if you want joy, you will have to lose your life in order to find it. This, my friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I want to invite you this morning. I want to just pray two simple prayers. The first prayer, when you, some of you were doing that evaluation, am I the person that puts my rights in front of others' rights? And you're realizing today that this is not how God was created, nor created us, and nor is it the way that we're designed to live. And that maybe you feel that this is a moment that you might need to repent. Can I want to pray that prayer with you. And then secondly, there are some of you who say that, you know what, J James, that is the Jesus that I've been waiting to hear about. That's what I want to hear. Not the pie in the sky. I'm talking about the one who, who actually is out there going to be protesting because the rights of others are important. Yeah, I know. I got a little political. But it's just the truth. That by serving and picking up the causes and the needs of other people that we somehow find fulfillment for ourselves and we fulfill the purpose in which God has created us. I know I was going away in, but I just want to say to you that this, if you're recognizing this Jesus is that's the one you want to follow, I want to pray and just invite you to accept him and encourage you to live for him. Would you pray with me? First, a prayer of repentance. Heavenly Father, I'm praying right now and I am your child. Probably been following you for a long time. And I'm realizing in this moment that I have never put myself second to anybody. I realize now that if you had done that, then the only thing that I am fit for is judgment. So, Father, I repent of my sin of selfishness. And I pray, God, that you would help me look and find opportunities to be a vehicle of love and joy to others, even if it costs me. Help my life, which seems to be falling apart like old bricks and mortar. And let there be a new, fresh water that flows through me, God. That allows me to be a river of life for others. Thank you for hearing my heart and this prayer of repentance. Amen. And now let me pray for you, those who are looking to receive Christ today. Just a short prayer. Heavenly Father, I have heard this sermon today and I get it and I'm excited because now I'm realizing that Jesus is one of action and that action means joy and love has to flow through people and I want to be one of those people. And so today, God, I give you my life. I ask you, Jesus, wash away my past and my sin and my faults and my, failure, say, fa and my failures and I pray that you would allow me to have a brand new start in Jesus. Come into my heart and make it your home. Give me a vision and power and how I can make the world better because I serve. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Beloved, if you've prayed that prayer today for the very first time, you know what I'm going to say. Happy birthday. Today is your brand new beginning. The Bible tells us that if anyone's in Christ, that the old is passed away and all things are new. You're new today.
And beloved, if you want to say, well, you know, now that I'm new and I want to get started, I, I, I would love to know what some next steps are. Look, send me a quick text, um, 708-616-1101, and just say, I've decided. That's all. Just send me a text. I've decided. And I want to be able to connect with you and even have a phone conversation with you or a Zoom conversation. And I want to send you some emails of some things to kind of help you to read and know how to continue following in Christ. Maybe even connect you with a good Bible study and a good Bible-believing church so that you can continue to be all that God's created you to be. So, beloved, that's our message for today. I'm hoping that you are pursuing joy and will attain joy. So go out and have a joy-filled day. God bless. Here at United Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, we celebrate Holy Communion every Sunday. And if you believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God and believe in his resurrection, you are welcome to share that table with us. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I bow before you in humility and ask you to examine my heart and remove anything that hinders my relationship with you. As I take this bread, representing your body that was broken for me, I remember. As I take this cup that represents your blood shed on Calvary's cross, I remember. I remember your suffering during your crucifixion. I remember the price you paid that covered all my sins. I remember your sacrifice giving your life for mine. I remember your victory over death that gave me eternal life forever. Father, let me always remember your faithfulness and unmerited love as I recommit my thoughts, my heart, and my life to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, amen. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this represents my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us together eat the bread of life. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink from the cup of salvation. Then Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Family, we serve a risen God whose kingdom has no end.